The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A hired man who is not a shepherd and whose sheep are not his own sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf catches and scatters them. This is because he works for pay and has no concern for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know mine, and mine know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I will lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. These also I must lead, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have power to lay it down and power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Jesus in the Gospel says, I am the Good Shepherd. For that reason, the fourth Sunday of Easter, since the earliest times of our church, has been dedicated to Christ the Good Shepherd. This is also a very familiar image. He used the image because he knew the Jewish people were also very familiar with that idea of the Good Shepherd. In the time of our Lord, sheep were raised for wool, for meat, and also for the temple sacrifices, especially at Passover. Josephus, the great Jewish historian, records how at Passover time, the population of Jerusalem would swell from about 500,000 to almost 3 million because any good Jew within a 100-mile radius usually tried to travel to Jerusalem. So Josephus says that at that time, about 100,000 lambs were, so- were slaughtered, were sacrificed for the Passover dinners. It's hard to almost imagine that. Then one has to think there must have been numerous shepherds and huge flocks all around Jerusalem. To some extent, it exists to this day. Nevertheless, the shepherd himself had to be very diligent. So a good shepherd had to protect his flock from the thieves and the wild animals. He had to bring nourishment to the flock, guiding them to green pastures and water and so on. He had to keep the flock together and lead that flock. Now, sheep need to be led. You may remember four years ago we had a deacon named Eric Clark, who is now a priest in the Diocese of Lincoln, Nebraska. His father was a ranch rancher. So he made the point on this very Sunday that one drives cattle, one leads sheep. But one then has to think that if you're leading the sheep, you have to make sure they're following. So like my mom would always say, you have to have like eyes in the back of your head to make sure they don't wander away. When I was thinking of what old mom said, I remembered how when I was smaller, she would take me with her to the grocery store. She would be pushing the cart leading the way. She always had to keep looking back after me because I might get stuck at the cookie aisle or in the bakery section or the candy section. The irony is the rules have reversed. Now I'm pushing the cart and I'm on the mission of the grocery store and every now and then I turn around and where's mom? Then I hear the little voice. Billy, where are you? And I find mom, the wandering sheep that's gotten lost. Anyway, back to the reality of all of this. We immediately see how Jesus fulfills the role as shepherd. He was sent by the Father, but he came to do the Father's will. 
He came, as he says, to lay down his life for us, the sheep. In that, he becomes not only the priest, but also the lamb of sacrifice. He offers for us, all the sheep, that sacrifice to atone for our sins and to open the gates of heaven. Jesus identifies himself as the way, the truth, and the life. As the good shepherd, he shows us the way. He leads us on that straight and narrow path through this life to the gates of heaven. He's the one who nourishes us, especially through the gift of the sacraments, in particular, the Holy Eucharist. He's the one who keeps us from evil and guards us by being the truth, revealing perfectly God's truth and God's love. So the Lord fulfills that image of the Good Shepherd. However, we need to remember it doesn't stop there. Our Lord entrusted to his apostles that same role, that same mission. He didn't leave us like this flock to be on our own, to sort of scatter. So we hear in our first passage how St. Peter goes to the Sanhedrin and he proclaims who Jesus is. So Peter, the first pope, is that chief shepherd. The apostles, Peter too, were the first bishops as well as priests. As time goes on, those apostles did ordain deacons to care for the welfare needs of the church. They also ordained priests to help them in their role. So our Lord gathered us as a flock through baptism, as St. John says, we're children of God, but he didn't leave us without shepherds. He gave the church the shepherds, the structure, the authority, the hierarchy, as we say. But be that as it may, we look then at our own little parish today. So here, I'm the pastor. So the pastor in Latin means shepherd. And parochia is the Greek word from which we derive parish. Parochia means sojourner. So my job as the shepherd is to help lead you, myself included, on the straight and narrow path to heaven. That's the goal. As a priest, then, I am responsible to provide you with the nourishment you need, especially the sacraments, in particular, the Holy Mass. I'm responsible for teaching the truth. I'm not here to be a comedian, not here to make everybody feel good. I'm here to challenge all of us by God's truth. This is so important in our world today. When we think about all that goes on around us, especially through the media, so easily a person can be led astray by what seems so appealing, so easy, so seductive, and how many people are lost because they're following a false shepherd who proclaims a false truth. We turn to always to that good shepherd, and I'm responsible for teaching his truth. When I think about my priesthood, for instance, at almost 34 years ordained now, I oftentimes think back when I was ordained. So when I was ordained, like any man preparing, at the ordination ceremony, he first takes vows of obedience to the bishop and also celibacy. That, in a way, is giving a statement, a promise of his whole life dedicated to the service of the Lord and the service of you, the flock. He then falls prostrate. And at the ceremony, there's the chanting of the litany of the saints, bringing down the intercession of all the saints. Then he rises, kneels before the bishop, and he's ordained as a priest. In a way, that's like a death and a resurrection, dying to himself to rise to serve the Lord, to be that good shepherd, to be the shepherd like Christ, to be the one who gives his whole life wholeheartedly. Sometimes I think then, going to the end of my life, one day I will face judgment and the Lord will hold me accountable for how well 
I have fulfilled my duties. So in that sense, you see, hopefully, that your priests that have served you throughout your lives are not like the hired hands that are just doing this for a job. This is a life. They've given their lives to the Lord and to you. We also keep in mind then, if the devil's going to attack, where is he going to start? Not outside the church. The devil knows he can't conquer the church from the outside. He'll keep trying, but he knows he can't do that. As Archbishop Sheen said, he'll always go within. And in particular, he'll strike the shepherds. Because if you strike the shepherd, you strike the priest, the flock's going to scatter. So key here on this fourth Sunday, pray for your priests. Keep them in your prayers. Poor human beings that we are, we've been called to this vocation, but pray for us. Pray that we have the grace we need to be the good shepherds. On this fourth Sunday, though, Pope Francis also asks us to pray for vocations. In the bulletin, you'll find this insert from Bishop Burbage that highlights the importance of vocations. We need young men to be priests, and we need young men and women to dedicate their lives as religious, too. As our little parish here, not too old, we have been blessed with vocations. So we look at our little parish, and we've had ordained Father Sly, who was a parishioner, and we've had Father Danny Heenan. We then have Joey Machetto, who in three years, God willing, will be ordained as a priest. We have also have James Joseph, who's a teacher at our grade school, who will be starting his seminary studies this fall. We also have had Sister Mary Lawrence taking her final vows as a Dominican sister of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. She's now teaching in Peoria. And then we have Sister Fatima, who's in the novitiate of the Little Sisters of the Poor. Very good. When we think about our little parish, we have been very fruitful, but that's the fruit of God's grace at work. We could also think and pray for the three men for our diocese who will be ordained priests this year, including Nicholas Shear, Father Shear's brother. We pray for our deacon, Ryan Mattingly, who will go back to Peoria soon, and there he will be a priest and serve that diocese. As a diocese, though, we're blessed. Last I heard, we have 45 men studying to be priests. How wonderful that is. Again, looking at our parish, we've been blessed the past few years to have young priests. So you don't have the old guy here by himself. You have Father Shear was here. And we had Deacon Noah Mori, who's now a priest in Manassas. And we have Father Farrell. Pray for him. But anyway, so we... <laughs> <laughs> Only kidding. But anyway, he's on vacation, so I can say these things. But anyway, so we're very blessed, though, because you know you travel the country, and it's like we don't see that. But it says something very good about our diocese, about our parish. So I ask you, though, to pray for vocations, including from your own family. Ask yourself, who is going to serve the next generation we need to be encouraging vocations. Now, with that in mind, when I talk to kids about vocations, priesthood, three questions always come up. One is, how did you know? Well, it would be nice to say, I received a text message from God saying, please become a priest, or you will become a priest, God. Well, no, that doesn't happen. It's something in the heart. It's a feeling, a gut feeling level feeling. So when I was a junior in college especially, I had this feeling. And I had my life planned out. Accounting major, law school, so on. Well, I'd go to Mass, and I would think, that's really what I would like to do. Then I would hear a homily, and I thought, well, that was good. I could do better. But, and then I would really think, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? So after graduating college, I finally came to the decision, put law school on hold, and I said, dear God, I give you one year. I'll give the seminary a try. So no matter what happens, no matter what I experience, I will give you one year. Well, one year has turned into a lifetime. So it's really that gut-level feeling 
but I think it must be like when a person falls in love for marriage. How do you know? You don't receive a text message, marry this person. You know it in your heart. And eventually you have to take that leap of faith. The second question is, what do you like doing the best? Well, what I'm doing right now. Mass, and that includes not only the sacrifice, but also the preaching and teaching. At Easter time, I think it's beautiful that having worked with adults preparing to come into the church for several months, then at that Easter Vigil Mass, I can administer baptism, confirmation, First Communion. That's a wonderful blessing. That's what a priest is about, though. And then lastly, the question is, do you have any regrets? And I can honestly say no. No regrets. Now, that doesn't mean it's always easy. Just like in marriage, good times bad, sickness and health till death do us part. Same thing with priesthood. There's tough times. There's times maybe even of discouragement or feeling overwhelmed. But overall, no regrets. I love doing what I do. So for all the young people, keep your hearts open. And I hope in your families, you encourage vocations. When we think of it, we have been blessed as a parish, as a diocese, really as a whole church. But we always have to ask ourselves, who will serve next as the Good Shepherd? And we also have to ask, where would we be without our priests? May God bless you.